Hello everyone, this is John from Coins, RPGs, and more. And in today's video, I'm going to do a follow-up to my video on the Cypher system. And in that video, I just I mentioned that I had a an alternate way that I used to teach the Cypher system to uh, younger people, to say people of middle school age or elementary school age. And I wanted to kind of talk about that in a separate video. Excuse me. So what I did is I broke the Cypher system down to some basic components. And I set it up so I could introduce each component of the character individually. Uh, this is done uh, in order to, while still providing choice, uh, limiting the choice to enough options that people can learn how it works without necessarily uh, being overwhelmed by the sheer number of options that exist in the Cypher system. So I'll go through that kind of a step-by-step. -step. Oh, one thing I did change in the system when I did it is I moved from D20 to 3D6 to use the bell curve. Uh, I initially did that because it was easier. I was doing this with students with visual impairments, and it was easier to get uh, six-sided dice in with Braille on them than it was to get a 20-sided die with Braille on it. Um, if I were to do this again, I would probably would just stick with the 20-sided die because, as I found out through play, uh, the vast majority of the players are just using automatic dice rolling apps. And the, the, having dice with Braille on them is not really important to them. Um, they're just fine with the app. So in, in hindsight, uh, going changing the die type really didn't uh, improve much. And it sort of it did mess up how the cipher system calculates difficulty a little bit. <clears throat> hey, excuse me. Bit of a sniffle today. I do apologize. All right. So the first step. The first thing you want to look at is uh, when you are first introducing uh, these young people to a game, and let's say you only have about an hour to an hour and a half, you don't want to spend the whole time making characters because they'll lose interest. They even like even older, more veteran players who've been around the block, they'll lose interest even faster in some cases because they'll be thinking about all the other systems that they already know that they could be playing without sitting here learning how to work a cipher system thing. And that, that just it gets long. Um, and they know they have limited time. So if you have four hours and you want to spend the first hour of that time making a character. Uh, with this new person or with those new people, then that's okay. And maybe this system isn't going to be for you. But I'm looking at those people that got limited time uh, and want to get to the game as quickly as possible because frankly, it's in the game where they're going to have your they're going to have their fun. and you as the game master will have your fun in the game. So the first thing you want to do is you want to look at the descriptors. I recommend, limiting your choices to about between six and ten descriptors. I would go more towards six uh, if you're working with a younger crowd. You want to give them enough so that they have choices to make, but um, you don't want to you don't want to overwhelm them. So around six is great. If they're a little bit older, maybe high school age, you can go with with you know, up to ten. And because uh, because um, remember, your idea isn't to make a character that's going to last forever. It's, it's a, to make a character that they can use for a couple of game sessions to get to know the system and get to know how the system works. And then you can introduce full character creation later or allow them to modify their character. So we've got our six. Now I recommend for the six, you pick things like strong, tough, um, any, basically think of because most people are going to come to Cypher System from Dungeons and Dragons, go through the list and pick out the ones that you feel best correlate to the six ability scores. I think uh, Swift is one, and and, and uh, Intelligent or uh, Smart or you know just just pick the ones that you feel work. Uh, charming, 
seductive. I think those are ones. I'll I'll double check. It's been a while since I've gone through that list exhaustively. Um, I haven't gotten play cipher system a lot recently, and this kind of this it started to fade from the memory. As soon as I pick up the book, I'm sure I'll remember. But um, for right now, I just let's just talk in we're talking in more generalities. So you pick your six. Now, but but John, you say, what about the the point pools? What about those three pools? Well, here's the fun part. You need the three pools to play, but you don't necessarily need all the other types, all the other the other pieces of each type to get started. So what I would recommend doing is you don't even have to tell your players what you're doing here. Just write it down on for yourself when you're making notes. They've got a 10 in everything. All three of their pools, there's a 10 in it. Um, it's all equal. I mean, you could also say, you could also, if you wanted to be uh, a little more stingy and whatnot, you could say they all they have eight in everything, make them even more basic character. Excuse me. Um, but when you do that, what that does is you're not assuming what type of character they're going to be you're making you're giving them basically a blank slate you are a hero so you're a strong hero you're a tough hero you're a swift hero okay and you're not asking them well you know what what type do you want to be don't ask them that i mean you could ask them to get if they have a general idea but maybe they don't and that's okay because they're still learning and, and that's what you want this is especially true for people who are new to role-playing games uh, they've never played a role-playing game before just provide them with that information so you're you're strong and and then put their character into a scenario let's say um what i did is i had their character suddenly appear in a a cage in the middle of a dark dungeon room um it wasn't completely dark but it was dark you know darkened enough and there was a goblin sleeping uh, next to a door that led out of the room that they were all in and the key to the cage was hanging from the goblin's belt and from there i i let them go so this, this is the first session this is their first introduction to the game you you give them a description of what's in the room you you can talk about the sights and the sounds you um give them you, you they've got the goblin to interact with they can try to wake it up and talk to it they've got they know the goblin has the key to their their cage to, so they, they have to do something with the goblin to get the key. Um, you can add something else to the room, like there's some boxes and crates or a, or a treasure chest over in a corner, depending on how complicated you want to be. And from there, let them pick what actions they want to take. And if one of them says, can I cast, do I know magic? No, do, do I have any magic? Well, then you can say, well, sure. What kind of magic do you want to, would you like to cast? Think of a very simple spell. And this is the one part where you've got to kind of rein people back a bit sometimes because sometimes they really want to be like, oh, I'm going to like summon a, a dragon to steal the key. Like, well, okay, well, how about you you try to summon a lizard? And it's a dragon lizard. And and that's, I mean, you can do that. And and then so they, they spend their points and you kind of tell them, okay, well, you have 10 intellect points and you can spend x number of points in order to cast this the spell to summon this creature and you know what that is because you know the rules and you know that you're kind of basically working off of a basic version of uh, of a spell or, or an ability for the adept and it doesn't all have to translate 100 percent to the cypher system rules or what what the adept can and can't do don't worry about that uh, right now right now you're worried about hooking them into the game you're worried about making sure they have some fun so keep what you're doing to a similar power level to what you see but let them come up with something that's unique something that's special to them and that's okay and if someone says well i want to try to pick the lock like you oh, okay well let's see uh what are you going to use to pick the lock and so they're they'll say well i i you know, I bet I had a lock. I, I bet I have a lock pick on me. Okay, cool. So you, your one item 
or you 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 have this lock pick on you and you kind of mark that off and say okay well you you that's your item uh each of you gets one item that you can kind of have secreted on you while you are in this cage something that you hid from the goblin and it has to be something small like a lock pick or um like a or a ring or something like that and just let let them have that one thing and let them decide as the gameplay goes. Don't tell them right away, like, pick your, th pick your item before the game starts, because, you know, once it starts, you can't change. Don't do that. Uh, let each each person decide what item. And once the first person says, oh, I have a lockpick, the next person says, well, what if I had a dagger? And like, well, you, I guess you could have probably have tried to hide a knife somewhere in your, in your loincloth. Okay, let's go with that. Let's go with a small, you got a small knife. Maybe it's not a full big on dagger. Maybe it's just little like a box cutter kind of thing. Something that's hidden. Um, and just keep keep going with that style of let them pick what they have and what they don't have. Let them solve the problem using their basic intuition and their basic problem solving skills. As that, and this, this one scenario will probably take the rest of your one hour game time as the players talk amongst each other and try to figure things out and they and they try different scenarios they maybe they talk to the goblin maybe they pick the lock and and sneak up to the goblin and stab it with a dagger to kill it um or whatever you know let them pick what they want to do have the next room decided but maybe the next room it give them a choice they they open up that door and there's a corridor and they go right or left and then describe the two doors and make the make the description of the doors evocative make it so that the they're slightly suggestive of what's behind each door but um but still very evocative so like a stone door or a an iron door or a bronze door or a a sewer grate or something that is very specific and you want to do this because you want to give them specific images to think about when they imagine what might be what might be behind that door and what um, what the door itself looks like. And that's going to help them create a map in their mind of this dungeon location that you're running them through. So that's the first session. And that's cool. So during that first session, you're going to have a relatively basic idea of how each player kind of wants to play their character. And you can actually go with just this, you know, strong hero or fast hero idea for two sessions even without putting more detail on things as you let them feel out how they want to play. Then by the second or third session, that's when you introduce the types to them. And you, you basically, instead of going like all in, on the types what you do is you say well it seems to me that your character you've been you you've been wanting to use spells two or three times and you've done well with those so i think that sounds like you're a bit of an adept is that is that correct what, what do you think and if they say yeah then you go with that and um excuse, excuse me and then you you give them some of the uh, the abilities of the adept uh give them the basic ones written down and and also make the decisions about what abilities they have based upon what they've already done. So if you've given them a custom ability that uh, isn't already on the adept list, just write in that custom ability. Let them have it. And um, and if it, if it turns out that it's really powerful, you can dial it back a little bit. That's okay. But mostly just let them have the things that they really wanted. And if what they really wanted, actually, like, for example, someone says, well, I want to cast a, a bolt of power spell to, to, to kill that goblin from range. Well, they've just, they've, uh, that's a spell that the adept has, the onslaught spell. You know, that's just, they've got a custom version of it. So you, you give them onslaught. Um, and if they're a warrior or a, a, someone who wants to be more of a, a you know, the thief types, and, and you just kind of, you, you make that work. You make you give them what they've already been doing. Let them tell you what their character is through gameplay, and just fill those those dots in. As they decide that they find things or need things, they can pick up items. Uh, they have have one or two interesting items in that chest, maybe like a, a short sword or a shield or uh, something. But keep the items keep the item amount low because you want 
you want only one short sword. You want only one shield. You want only one whatever. And the idea behind that is to force them to force them to decide which one of them is going to be the one that has the short sword to, and, and uses it to fight with instead of um, of like everyone grabs a short sword and then you're confused because you're not sure who's going to be the actual fighter type person that this kind of this is what helps you and then you can have like one one sword one a book maybe that has magical spells written in it and then that the person that you has been going for the spells would be like oh that book is mine that's totally mine okay that helps you um so after the second or third session then you've you've given them their type and you can slowly fill in this type as you go. You don't have to have it all filled in right at the beginning. Just give them the boosts to their, their stat pools that are appropriate for the type um, and for the descriptor that they already have. That's That you've already calculated in. So if they pick strong, you give them the extra four points to their strength that strong gives. Things like that. And... And play with that for the rest of that session, maybe another session beyond. So we could be looking at session three or session four at this point. And by that point, that's when you start thinking about the foci. Because by then, you'll have seen what it is that that character tends to want to focus on. And you can start creating a crafting a list of a small number of foci that is a potential for each character and i'd say stick to like three three possible foci for each character and after the fourth session before the fifth session or maybe in the beginning of the fifth session you can start presenting that list to them and say okay well it seems to me like your character has been doing x y and z X, Y, or Z. So which one is the thing that you really want to focus on? What is what is your desire? And at that point, then they can choose. And you give them the first tier abilities for that foci. And then they have something else to play with. But they but instead of you know having that all at once, they built up to that point over several sessions. By now, they should already know how the basic uh, dice rolling of the cipher system goes and how to calculate their own pools, and they should be starting to keep track of their own pools. And so the foci is just adding a little bit extra onto it, uh, maybe adding some more skills and that one, one extra ability, things like that. And that slow progression of building your character is a method that I've used in the past, and it has worked really well with younger people and people that are just new to the game that don't want to, they want, they want to make their own character. They don't want to be given a pre-generated character. And that's where this, this really shines, is when you don't when you just have a small amount of time, you want people to play with the characters that they make themselves and not what you what you're assuming, but you also know that you're gonna have them for multiple sessions during this time. You know that they're uh, it's not like a one shot at a game store. A one shot at a game store, I would go with pre-generated characters. This is more for introducing young people to it through a campaign. And then after that, that folk guys introduced, you go for, you know, two or three more sessions. And at that point, they should be really getting pretty comfortable. And by then, they should have also had a chance to, you know, defeat the dungeon, whatever dungeon you put them into, whatever scenario. It doesn't have to be a dungeon, but, you know, they defeat it and they go to town. Now, this is important. You don't want to start them in town with this. I don't think. My feeling is you don't want to do it. You want to start them with a dungeon. The reason why you start with a dungeon is because a dungeon is contained. A dungeon is a controlled environment where you can control where they go and what they can do. Now, you're not doing this because you want to be a jerk. Make that very clear. You're doing this because you want to make sure that you give them measured options to allow them to safely explore the system. You can provide monsters that they can face that challenge them without necessarily automatically killing them. Because the last thing you want to do is have the first monster that they ever encounter kill one of the player characters. Okay, don't do not do that. Especially when it's new people. If it's old veteran players that have been around for a while, that's okay. But you, you know that about them all at this point already. But if it's someone who's new to the game, especially someone who's never played an RPG before, don't kill their characters on the first encounter. 
That's a huge problem. In fact, I would say don't kill their characters during the first three sessions, at least. Even if you think, they're asking for it. They're being obnoxious. They're, you know, I'm going to challenge a dragon to a duel. Well, why is there a dragon in the dungeon? Why did you, why did you as a game master put a dragon in the dungeon that they could challenge? Now, if you wanted to have a dragon, you could maybe have a, the image of a dragon. So a, a dragon chooses to appear to them for some reason or is captured by a spell or, or whatnot. And they can interact with the dragon, but they can't really challenge the dragon. They can't fight the dragon. The dragon can't really harm them. Uh, do, do something like that to introduce the element of a dragon or the element of a, of a big bad monster. But make sure that you don't set it up. Don't set your players up for failure during this. Uh, and once they have managed to uh, face your several very evocative rooms, um, you know, give them a couple of puzzles, give them things to laugh at, make it fun, make it funny, and don't make it grim dark. Um, don't make it to make it don't make it so gritty unless your players have really requested that unless they want that. And that's fine. They too. That's the session zero. And then once they've done all that, they've accumulated some treasure. They've gotten some experience. They know how the game works at this point. They've, they've picked up some items along the way from treasure chests. So one of them probably has some armor. One of them probably has a, a you know a magical staff at this point of some kind or a wand or a book. And some of them have like daggers and thieves tools and you know, all these other things that you've, you've let them have over time. That's when they get to go to town when they're a bit more confident in what they know to do with the game. You, that's when they can finish the dungeon, go to town, and sell their loot, maybe pick up some actual better equipment. And this is the point that you make sure that you have updated the character sheets to include all the data that is usually on a Cypher System first tier character sheet. So any of the items that they, you would usually get by... Uh, by starting out that's what they either have already picked up by this point or that's what they can get at the town um, and the same goes with any other like any other esoteries or abilities for the adept or for the other types like the speaker can learn a few extra tricks and things like that. And maybe the speaker goes to the tavern and, and learns a few speaking tricks from a local bard and things like that. And that's when you, you finish, you finish fleshing out the character sheets and you've got full characters for everyone. And this could take up to 10 sessions. If you're doing one, one and a half hour session, this could take a while and that's okay. That's actually ideal because you've, They've slowly built up to where they are and they can feel a lot more ownership of where they are because of that. So don't be, don't feel bad or, or and don't uh, second guess yourself. That's okay. And now they have full fleshed out characters. They've used every section of the character sheet. They've slowly been introduced to how everything works and they can feel a lot more confident. And from there, uh, you can either keep going with those characters or you can start offering, hey, are there things that you want to change about your character? There's this, this the, temp the temple of change is in town. And uh, for a small donation of your treasure, you can uh, change your type or change your descriptor or change your foci and make it part of the world a little bit. So it kind of, it, it feels less uh, arbitrary from the gm -y from the GM point of view, but also uh, it make it something that they can use in, in game to explore more options of the game and maybe come back to it a couple sessions later. Because remember, these are people that are new to the game and maybe they want to try something different. And if they have that option, they a lot of people won't really take it. A lot of people kind of, they, they learn what they like and they have it and they're like, oh, I want to stick with this. I, I just want to, don't worry about it. But some people do. Some people like to change things up. And that's that should be something that they can do. Now, you need to be scrupulously honest with, about this and, and make sure to take away abilities that are included in that in that thing and, and give them the, the new ones when they change a, a descriptor or a foci or a type. Uh, but let them know about that ahead of time. Let them know what's gonna what would be changed so that they are not surprised by these things. And I would also argue 
that what you could do is you could invent some sort of save point that you can use with these these new players and maybe ha maybe that's part of the temple of change uh, or the or the temple and they can uh, they can pay to have their spirits locked to this place and what that means is anytime something bad happens to them anytime their, their characters are killed or lost in the next dungeon they will resurrect in this space they'll come back into the space kind of like what happens in video games that's what you're creating you're creating a video game save point in your rpg i recommend this um and put some put some cost on it make sure it costs the character something because uh, that will matter to the players but they should know that it's it's something that they can do so that they can feel comfortable to explore the world uh, knowing that if they make a mistake it's not the end of the game. And and let them know that this this does have like there's limited time uses. Like you can only use this magic three times or something like that. You know, let them know ahead of time. You can only use it so many times and then it just doesn't work anymore because of how magic works. And then they that's what they know. And they know that um, they have some freedom, but they don't have an unlimited freedom. And that also means that as the game goes on, you can kind of dial back from that and say, well, actually, you're you're really far away. And so maybe it's, it's probably if you've gone to the next country, maybe your connection with that old temple is not strong anymore. And um, or you haven't paid to upkeep it, you know, and, and it can go away eventually. So that's a basic idea. That's how I would introduce the cypher system to some new players. You can use that. I've, I've designed it. I designed it for use with a fantasy setting. You can use that with a science fiction setting or any other setting, really. I think the same thing would work with Numenera or The Strange without much, uh, without much tinkering. I personally like this method better than what I saw in No Thank You Evil. And that's not a dig at No Thank You Evil. No Thank You Evil is a really fun looking game that relies on a single D6 and has some really cool aspects to it. I personally like what I put together more because it works It works as a stepping up, a, a kind of a step stair into the Cypher system itself using the same mechanics as the Cypher system and giving you a full-fledged Cypher system character by the end of the process. Your mileage may vary. This may not be what, what works for you, but it, it worked for me, and I hope that other people might be willing to give it a try, or maybe you've got a better suggestion. Maybe you have some thoughts that you'd like to share with me about a different way of teaching the Cypher system to people, especially younger people. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.